Crew Alexandra isn't the most historic club in England. Founded in 1877, adjacent to the Crew Cricket Club, the Alexandra part was named after Princess Alexandra. It's not a team of royalty though, being founded by railway workers. Plus, it's a club that has never been to the Premier League. The closest was in 1998, where they placed 11th in what is now known as the Championship. Since 1921, they have never fallen further down the 4th Division. However, with the last 20 years swapping between League 1 and 2, can I bring them into the Premier League for the very first time? It was going to be a challenge, with the team expected to get relegated. Coming with experience from Football Manager, I've never had success in the English Pyramid. It's a cruel system if you don't know what you're doing, and trust me, a lot of clubs don't. I once got sacked by a League 1 side, then hired by a League 2 club Northampton Town, only to get relegated because I didn't realize they were under administration. That led to a Romanian excursion, but that's a story for another day. Back to reality, it's gonna take time for me to understand how good or bad my team is because man, these attributes are low. Still, no matter what, I was gonna use a 4 4 2 Route 1 style. Brexit means Brexit, apparently. Introducing the players in net was Harvey Davis on loan from Liverpool, although it will be a tough choice between him and Tom Booth. Ryan Cooney would play at right fullback and Zach Williams on the left. He could also set up centrally, but we had options like Mickey Demetriou, Connor O'Riordan, and captain Luke Offord. In central midfield, Joe White was on loan from Newcastle, Jack Powell looked like a decent veteran playmaker, and Charlie Colquett rounded out the better options. On the wings, Shiloh Tracy and Aaron Rowe on loan from Huddersfield Town gave us limited choices. Up top, there was Courtney Baker Richardson, Elliot Nevitt, and Chris Long. It didn't seem perfect, but that was what we had by opening day. Although, there was an academy player that got my attention, and his name? was Max Woodcock. Yes, that's really his name. The first thing to note about the team are the bench sizes. Only seven spots, which I thought was small. My lineup selection also offended and even hurt some feelings. Although, after telling everyone to enjoy themselves, they were hyped. There are several clubs to watch out for in League 2, and our opponent's Mansfield Town is one of them. Playing the narrow formation of the 4-4-2, the Stags managed to bring forth a quandary. That's because our debut went the opposite of good. Only three minutes in, we conceded. Oh a free kick later, and it was 2-0 Mansfield Town a quarter hour in. As I was witnessing my team completely falling apart, a little hope was sparked when Tracy's cross landed for a long goal. That brought us back from despair, as shortly after, Long turned into provider, equalizing this match. Then, about 90 seconds later, Powell had a free kick. And now free kick Powell? <gasps> Our death was over exaggerated as we scored two more for a 5-2 win. What a debut from yours truly. Scoring didn't seem like a problem, but defending maybe. After elimination from the Carabao Cup to Leeds, we would go on and lose our next two fixtures, 9-6 overall. Five conceded to Swindon, led by Gez Simple, alongside big boy Charlie Austin. Newport County was even worse, as we pulled a Mansfield and balled a two-goal lead. The winning return versus Walsall thanks to Colcat's winner, which brought forth the last game of August. Bradford City, managed by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Mountains are there to be climbed, aren't they? The Bantams have spent the majority of the 21st century in the fourth tier, but had once a brief spell in the Premier League. With Ole at the wheel, I supposedly sparked a feud, according to one of these two journalists. Long shots were the name of the game to begin the campaign, and that continued as Jamie Walker gave Bradford the advantage. It wasn't going our way today, as towards the end, they'd get a second. Ole celebrated, and we left in shame. That was the end of our first month at Crew, but on deadline day, we made several deals. Firstly, Imari Samuels arrived on loan as he could cover both fullback positions. Coming from Brighton, he was joined by Noel Aton, who was a central defender. Our attack needed more options, so Josh Martin was signed on a free for the wings. Finally, Courtney Baker Richardson was sold for 51 k letting us loan in Joe Hugel from Manchester United. With him, we could go Long and Hugel up top, or potentially Hugel Woodcock, or even Long Woodcock. We went with the first option versus MK Dons, a club known for the wrong reasons. 
Now based in Milton Keynes, they used to be Wimbledon FC, a club that had history, including one of the most shocking FA Cup wins in the chronicle of the competition. However, with a consortium takeover in the early 2000s, they were controversially moved to Milton Keynes in 2003, changing their name a year later to MK Dons, meaning Wimbledon were dead. On to our match, will the new signings bring consistency, or will the Clown Fiesta remain? Patience was required, as despite creating good chances, introducing so many new names had us go down 2-0 by the half. I tried to focus down the flanks in response, and nearly went down 3-0. So, it was time to bring back the secret plan. 4 triple f two. And with Woodcock on the right, he whipped in a ball to Hugel, who headed it off the post, but Josh Martin was there to tuck it home. Shortly, Woodcock was for some reason on the other side of the pitch, but he sent a dangerous ball in behind where Long was brought down for a penalty. 2-2, two two, thanks to the Woodcock effect. And while our opponents nearly took the lead, we went straight down where Hugo hit the woodwork again. Then, within 7 before the added minutes, Long's header sent Hugo in. Hugo, can he finally score? He finally scores his first, and the comeback is complete. In the 100th minute, we had one more. Atomic. All that drama, only for us to lose to the current Wimbledon. AFC, 2-1, right after. Hugo scored, but also got sent off. We then conceded an 88th minute equalizer to Forest Green Rovers in the following fixture, and lost to a strong Colchester side to go 3 winless. It wasn't going to get easier, as Hollywood was calling. I just ignored the phone call, as Woodcock pounded Mr. I live in Pound Ridge, New York himself. With that win, form picked up, defeating Gillingham thanks to Long and Woodcock, destroying the ever so popular Salford, and keeping a clean sheet versus Tranmere Rovers. Surprisingly, that had his place in 6 through 13 match days. Crew lifts crew. <laughs> it was a nice time. But just as quickly as we got up there, we fell off nearly as fast. By match day 20, we lost 4 more, including a thrilling contest with the undefeated Stockport County. Apparently, a historic rival, from their perspective. Down 3-0 at the 42nd minute, Josh Martin's goal and a Hugo Brace equalized the encounter. Unfortunately, on loan Louis Berry would get the winner for the Hatters. These results had us dropped to 9th, 5 points out of the playoffs and it continued to be a rocky road in December. Elimination from two cup competitions within three days was a bad sign for the month. December in English football is wild. If we include New Year's Day, we had four games in 10 days. Added to that, unlike the Premier League where they play 38 fixtures, from championship and below, you play 46 with three cup competitions on the side. Now lower league clubs rely on ticket sales, so having this many matches is theoretically important in order to sustain themselves. Yet the players' fitness levels aren't quite as high, training conditions aren't what you expect with only a couple coaches, although our facilities are excellent, which is a rarity. Granted, four draws if we include the New Year's Boar Fest versus Ole's Bradford. Tough month, boss. It's not that Ryan Dicker, it's Michael Leach. What, one of the two journalists that actually show up? Yeah, I swear that guy hates me, and I answer all his questions! I heard he's not trustworthy, better to ignore it. Ignore it? Crew, one win in the last month, what are you gonna do? No comment. Well, any transfers to look forward to? No comment. Bars. All in all, we dropped into mid-table. Still, it was only a 5 point difference, and with new blood coming in January, there was time to keep fighting. Mansfield Town were in the promotion spots, so let's once I again... Am Adam. Two goals from Adam led to a 3-0 victory. Swinton Town following was tough, especially when Charlie Austin equalized, but Chris Long stepped up to grab a brace himself. We would make a free transfer in the middle of the month with Owusu arriving. He's a striker, but I thought I could train him as a center mid. He got his debut off the bench against Nigel Pearson's Barrow. He didn't do much, unlike Joe Hugel, whose brace rescued a point. To round off January, we faced Salford, a club known more for their owners than their performances on the pitch. Although, they pulled off a historical move by employing the English League's first ever female manager, Emma Hayes. 
and a Dingley's 13-day caretaker role isn't recorded in this universe. Salford were in the relegation zone, and the Woodcock showed the crowd why. A hat-trick from him exemplified why he deserved a new contract. Just a couple points from the promotion spots, but League 2 has shown to be cruel, and that cruelness was merely paused. Max Woodcock's goal in the 85th minute gave us a 3-2 lead over Tranmere. However, right before the 90th, a poorly cleared header was then missed by Powell, which saw Norris equalize. Another draw occurred straight away, with Crawley Town ending 2 all. Oh my gosh, that is some cheese. It wasn't getting easier with our historic rivals Stockport. They were flying this season, only suffering their first loss in December. Even crazier, they made the Carabao Cup semi-final, defeating Wrexham, Carlisle, West Ham, Luton, and Bournemouth on their way there. However, due to all those matches, their league form faltered as they won and win a single match in January. However, they pushed Manchester City in the EFL Cup, losing 4-3 in the first leg. The second leg isn't worth talking about. After it all calmed down, their form turned around before they faced us. We both hit the post, however, like last time, Louis Berry scored for them. Louis was doing a lot of that, but we had a man desperate to catch up, and that was Max Woodcock. One all, and I would have taken it. But here lies the problem for us. Goalkeeping, a frustrating goal to concede, and I really need to have a look at our keepers. Booth and Davis are both young, Nevertheless, if we're going to concede a lot, we might as well play the guy we actually own. Now four points out of the playoffs, we were able to rebuild ourselves thanks to a Woodcock brace versus Harrogate oh. Town and a thrilling victory over promotion favorites, Notts County. That saw Hugo secure his hat-trick and the game winner in the 88th minute. Putting the ball into the net was rarely an issue, as another win arrived versus Morecambe. Yet, no matter who was in the back line, clean sheets were rare. Within one point of the final playoff spot, that was the closest we would get. Doncaster were saved by the bell in a 2-1 defeat, while Sutton Town had a wacky end to our promotion chances. Down 2-1 with less than 5 to go, Tom Booth conceded this. We were able to get within one again, only for them to secure a penalty in the 95th minute, which they converted. Booth on a 6.1 led to Liverpool's Loney playing the rest of the season. A draw to MK Dons following dropped us 6 points out. Despite winning consecutive fixtures straight away, the gap remained. Several drop points at the beginning of April had us falling further down. The only shining light was Max Woodcock catching up to Louis Berry in goals. Unfortunately, the Woodcock would get injured, finishing the campaign on 19, while Louis ended on 21. It was a tough experience in our first season with Crew, as losing the final match to champions Colchester was a somber end to the campaign. They were joined alongside Stockport and Mansfield for automatic promotion. Meanwhile, in the playoffs between Bradford, Doncaster, Notts County, and MK Dons, the final would be decided between the division's top scorer Langstaff of Notts and Ole's Bradford. In the end, it was Ole going up, while the Magpies, like us, needed to go again. Looking at the player stats, not a lot of good performers, which included Hugo, who was finishing his loan. Our issue was obvious, we had the 4th most goals for, but on the other hand, we conceded the 5th most. So, let's go again. How did we get worse? Oh my, someone called the National Weather Service. Turnover is normal in the lower leagues, and that was the same for us, releasing several players. However, we also had a massive sale with Connor O'Riordan being sold to Derby for over half a million pounds. Not much would be spent as it helped us avoid being in the red. Still, almost 50 of it was used on Rico Brown from Birmingham. Like most sides in this division, we relied on free transfers. During last season, I was able to bring in Luke Barry, whose influence didn't come into fruition. In net, former Newcastle keeper Mark Gillespie improved the position, or so I thought. We also brought in Maldini, Maldini Katsuri, a former Arsenal youth product. Continuing, Imari Samuels returned on a free transfer, along with Joe Hugo, which was a huge relief. Kyle John joined too, and he could play both flanks at the back. The final free transfer was a massive signing from Rangers. Nigerian international, Leon Balogun. Better defenders, worse results. To round it off, Eli King was loaned in from Cardiff City as a midfielder. Elijah Morrison joined him from the championship as an intriguing option on the wings. Finally, from Everton, the Sheriff comes to town with Martin Sheriff. We didn't have to cover too much of the wage for these guys, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised being 17th, 
when our team's salary was the second lowest. It's not like all of our performances were bad, but things weren't clicking consistently. A scoreless draw to Crawley began October, and the stalemates continued. Woodcock returned to take the lead versus Morka. Then came the 93rd minute. It's the goalie! The confusion of the keeper must have impacted our team, as a different max equalized the match. Our new center back pairing weren't in sync, and the pain wouldn't end there with Knox County. They were once again a favorite for promotion. Wait, so were we. And we're doing this bad? Yet, against the pesty magpies, we were winning. Hugo opened the encounter with a little help. Unfortunately, they had one of the best strikers in the lower leagues, Langstaff, equalizing with a half hour left. We were desperate for a win, and a goal came from an unlikely source. Rico Brown. Or should I say, Groundinho getting us back ahead. Alas, Knott's County began cooking near the end, and we kept falling further behind, conceding a late equalizer again. Versus our friends in Milton Keynes, we once again took the lead, long reminding us not to forget about him. But a slim advantage isn't enough. So moments later, we did something we've only done thrice this season. Take a two goal advantage. And what a way to do it, Owusu. Unlike against recently relegated Carlisle, we were able to keep the forefront till the end and turn the season around. Our crew finally earned consecutive wins after defeating Nigel Pearson's Barrow, followed by the destruction of Salford City. However, even with a good form returning, that form would be temporary. November would see two more wins, two draws, and a loss. Not disastrous, but there was a penalty shootout loss to Doncaster in the EFL Trophy, which led to our elimination. Regardless, we shot up the table and sat right outside the playoff spots. December last year caused us problems, so that needed to change. Our starting 11 generally looked like this, although as always in English football, slight changes are made with an abundance of fixtures. Forest Green Rovers opened the month. They had Troy Deeney. Thankfully for them, he wasn't managing. Busted. Instead, it was Edward Still, the older brother of Will. Did you know he played football manager? Shut the fuck up. This would be a great start to the month, as the Wood of Cock assisted Hugo and later scored for himself. Forrest Green made it interesting for about five minutes, but Rico Brown sealed it with quite a nice strike. Grimsby were then defeated midweek in the FA Cup. Following, we faced one of the two newly promoted sides, Dagenham and Redbridge. Like many, they couldn't handle Woodcock, who aided in a 2-0 result. Doncaster afterwards continued to be a pain in my ass, as they had a 3-0 lead in the opening 12 minutes. 4-1 by the half. We were able to push within one thanks to the Sheriff and Tracy, but a late pen made Amari's goal at the death a mere consolation. However, our scoring wouldn't be stopped. 2-2 versus Accrington, after this, Chris Long would miss this, and also this, but I figured it out. For him to score, he has to be precisely three yards out. Elijah Morrison would seal the victory with a fourth, and four seemed to be my favorite number, as that was the amount we smacked into the net versus Stevenage. While our opponents fought very well, Woodcock's brace, which included the winner, would be enough. Max would conclude his and our incredible month with a goal versus Crawley Town. That would bring his second straight Player of the Month award. While I finished in second for the Manager's award? Why did they give it to Mike over me? Although, me and Max both signed new deals. All of this brought us up to fourth by the time the new year rolled around. Our first opponents of 2025 would be third place Morkum. Unfortunately, Max was unfit. Therefore, I shifted a winger into an inside forward. Chris Long would play there and become revolutionary. It was an electric start with Tracy smacking the bar, so Long decided to show how it was done. Tracy knew his role and decided to find Long with a brilliant cross to the far post, handing us a 2-0 advantage. Despite some terrible defending, we held on and snatched third place. It was anyone's game for that spot, with ninth only four points behind. Before continuing a challenging January, an FA Cup encounter versus Southampton was up. It was rare to see our crowd sell out, but we gave them a show with Joe Hugel tying it up with 20 to go. Unfortunately, their quality showed with a Stuart Armstrong free kick and biased officiating leading to a penalty and red card. A good effort versus the Saints, and it didn't impact our league form. Northampton Town was tight when it shouldn't have been. Luckily, Hugo was able to grab the sole goal. Now, 
it was time to play the top two. First, Knotts County, where the previous fixtures have been tense. I decided to continue with Long as the inside forward. However, the Magpies were missing their star man, Langstaff. They almost scored first. And also had this rule for offside. Maybe that was a sign of destiny. Destiny for Woodcock to open the encounter. Knotts County still gave us problems, but it wasn't a smash and grab with Woodcock stopped. After his favorite minute passed by, Imari Samuels made a brilliant delivery to the back post for Tracy, increasing the lead. To confirm the victory, Josh Martin, who had been quiet, knuckled one over the keeper, confirming our victory. From a former first place team to another, MK Dons were up. They also had a top scorer named Ellis Harrison. He didn't start for them either. We meanwhile kept our attack the same. That faith was rewarded as Woodcock again opened it up. Minutes later, he assisted Hugel, giving us a quick two goal advantage. However, MK Dons were first for a reason and were able to give themselves a chance with a second half to go. Unfortunately for them, it was our day again where Balgon's header led to Hugel's tap in. That's how it ended which means the top two were defeated, and our position in third was starting to increase. Who knows, maybe we'll be able to breach the top two positions. Oh my god! With Balogun's knee exploding, leading to his eventual retirement a few months later, that left us in a panic. As we all wore our Balogun jerseys before kickoff versus Cheltenham Town, things weren't right with us. Balo was a respected figure in the dressing room, and with him gone, we were out of sorts and lost to Cheltenham. Thankfully versus Carlisle, the Sheriff was back in town to freshen the attack, handing us a solid victory. Transfer dealings needed to be made, especially for the Balogun replacement. That would be Willy Bolly. Despite his lack of pace, his veteran experience is exactly what we needed. Other deals included Owusu being sold to Cork City, while Norwich granted us the loan of Uria JJ. On to our first match with the new players, we faced Tranmere Rovers. With midfield issues, Zach Williams started there, while Bali paired up with the youngster Maldini. There wasn't much to mention for the opening 45, until late on where Zach Williams pushed Tranmere's player for a penalty. Gillespie never saves penalties as our opponents open the encounter. Moments later, the sheriff was off duty. Post the interval, Woodcock was somehow stopped, but in the 68th minute, the book of Eli opened our account. Now, Willie Bolly wasn't having the greatest of games, sitting on a 6.5 rating. Williams, that is twice in a game. Why didn't I sub you off earlier? We're about to go two on down because Gillespie. Why doesn't Williams stop following people in the box? Is he stupid? I know. Red card. Back to the penalty. I'm, I'm expecting this to go into the back of the net. He saves it. I had to adjust the tactic and we were keeping the score level. But in the 90th minute, Tracy stupidly gave it away and Willy Bolly lost his man Dalby who headed in the cross. I won all or nothing, seeing us concede a third. Some terrible individual performances, which gave us a loss, barely keeping us in the top three. Next up was Wrexham. That was the first time we lost consecutively in the league since September, knocking us out of the top three. Of course, Bowley had another stinker and needed to be dropped. And you know what? We began winning again. They were all narrow fixtures with Barrow staying 1-0 for a while until Long cleared the way. Salford also kept it close and Swinnon were barely thwarted with a Sheriff and Long once again. That returned us to third with a two point gap. Results are inconsistent in our division, no matter what club you are. With that in mind, let's play Wooly Boy versus 24th place Woking. Bolly off. Don't want to see you, man. Worst signing ever. To be fair, it wasn't just him, as five minutes after Hugo's brace, we conceded an equalizer to Matt Smith, who could barely run. With nothing else to show, we drew and dropped out of third again. Unfortunately, due to fitness issues, I had to play the dreaded Bolly at center back and Williams at center mid. It didn't seem like a problem with us going 3-0 up by the half, although Sutton found one. I saw no issue. But moments later, Zach Williams arrived and conceded a penalty. Cheers, lad. We still secured a fourth, and despite allowing another goal late, we left with a victory. Although, Baldy with another bad match rating was the last draw for him. I would go with Offert and Brown, but because of Brown's lousy fitness, Williams would have to play too. Better there than center mid. You may be saying I'm being harsh to Bali, but he dropped these ratings against newly promoted clubs. Man's finished. Now we were behind Cheltenham Town for third, but Bali or not, 
Walsall would hit us early. Fighting for a playoff spot, they desperately needed a result. Even when we equalized in the second half, they stayed strong, seeing Isaac Hutchinson smacking in this. We were on the brink of defeat and about to drop from our desired position once more. That was until the end. Come on, Sheriff. Come on. One more. One more. There wouldn't be another, as we stayed behind Cheltenham. Thankfully, Grimsby Town are bad, and their performances showcased it with us building up a 3-0 lead. At the same time, Gillingham were defeating Cheltenham. Grimsby ended up getting a goal back after I subbed on the young Maldini, but we were in control. Don't you fear? The Sheriff is here. A win secured, and third place returning to us. Gillingham did defeat Cheltenham, and with them next, we could finally separate away from our rivals. Thankfully, they made our job easy with Connor Masterson's 16th minute red card causing a penalty. I gotta give credit to Gillingham as they made it difficult, but we earned a 3-1 victory. That added with Cheltenham's loss finally giving us a large gap between third and fourth. Three of our next four opponents were in the bottom five. It could be problemsome with them desperate to survive, but we pulled through against all three of them. It wasn't easy, but we secured promotion and moved up the English pyramid. Some big injuries could have damaged our season, but with three players with 17 or more goals, we could have two woolly ballies and still find success. I'd like to give a congrats to Elijah Morrison, who got into the PFA Team of the Year. I thought we'd see more of our guys, but without strong Notts County and MK Dons are, it makes sense. The three of us would eventually be joined by Gillingham, who defeated Cheltenham Town in the playoff final in extra time. League 2 provided many cruel moments, but what will League 1 have in store?